Hi, I'm James Raw for Outlook TV, and we're here at Heritage Hall at the corner of Main and 15th for the annual Women's Winter Arts and Crafts Fair. Now, Heritage Hall has been playing host to this event for the past eight years, and if you think it's just a bunch of ladies getting together to sell their wares, well, you're in for a big surprise. When I first started, I was thinking in terms of what has been happening to women over thousands of years and I've done a lot of reading and myths and seeing that there are very few images for women that give women a sense of who they are. This piece is, is the grandmother and it's called The Old One Sings the Truth. Uh, many children, young girls are told that they have to wait, they have to be subservient. And this grandmother is saying, no you don't. This grandmother is saying to her granddaughter, you can do anything. I'm really happy to be here because people are liking my work and I want to want to take it home. And it seems to be mostly women who want to learn to do this. I think when they see women doing it, they say, oh, I've always wanted to do that, but I thought it was a man's thing. So it's, it's really um, nice to see that I can pass that on and uh, help empower other women and help them to express themselves creatively. There was a bit of um, apprehension with all that's been going on in the world about as far as sales or would people come out and of course the weather is always an unknown. But uh, I would say for the most part it's been quite wonderful and uh, I, I haven't talked to too many of the craftswomen but I think most people enjoyed it, they did well. And this is just a lovely atmosphere, it really is, and people love coming to this building and this particular venue and this particular fair because it's very sociable too. Well, this wraps up yet another Women's Winter Arts and Crafts Fair for this year, but if you're a budding artist and you'd like to attend next year's event, you can contact Pat Hogan at 604-253-7189. Reporting in Vancouver for Outlook TV, I'm James Raw. Welcome to the holiday edition of Outlook TV. I'm Giovanni and tonight we have a couple of segments. I'll be back with Out in the City about all the festive events that are taking place in our community. But first we join Larry Colsey who tries to find the Christmas spirit at a loving spoonful. This time of year, it's so easy to become overwhelmed with shopping and cooking and in the frenzy of all the chores of Christmas. I've come looking for the true spirit of Christmas, and I think I found it. Ho, 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 hey, what's happening, guys? Filling Christmas hampers. Yeah? <laughs> Where'd all this food come from? Donated by the community. And what are you going to do with it all? Give it to all our clients for Christmas. Yeah, like, how many do you have to do? 150. Wow. So, um, is this a, a one-time thing, or are you, are you providing meals all the time? What's the... Well, the, this size, the hamper, is just at Christmas time, but we, we feed those 150 people every week with frozen meals that we um, put out every Tuesday with volunteer drivers. Wow, where did all this come from? These are our donations from the community. They've been in our donation boxes all around town. And there were paper bags in Extra West the last couple issues. Yeah. So what kind of stuff are you looking for? Looking for, obviously, any non-perishable food, mm. soups. We like meals in a can because they're easy to cook. Um, but we're also looking for toiletries, towels, socks, blankets, Christmas presents, the things that normally wouldn't be given out at a food bank. We're here today to deliver meals to people living with HIV and AIDS. We do it because somebody very close to me has been living with the HIV for about 16 years now and he has maintained good health, but we know that there are so many people living with HIV and AIDS who haven't been that fortunate. So we're, we come to support him and to support the cause. These people who we deliver to, um, I'm we are probably the only people they see for maybe the whole week or many, many days at a time. So they really appreciate us coming in. The food also, but also our presence. So it's really fulfilling. We sometimes we'll miss um, 
a week or something like that. And when we come back, it's really nice to hear them say that they say, oh, we really missed you last week and things like that. And it's really good to hear and, you know, that they appreciate you coming. Giving food is such a basic act that I think that it's really symbolic and affirming each time you do it. It's not like some people just can't do office work every single time, but the act of giving food is really spiritually and community based. This isn't the North Pole and there are no elves, but the volunteers at A Loving Spoonful really know the joy of giving. I came looking for the spirit of Christmas and I find that it's here all year long. Feeling very warm and fuzzy. I'm Larry Colsey for Outlook TV. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Larry. And here's what's happening in our community during the festive holiday season. There's a candle worship service at Christ Alive Metropolitan Church on December 24th. It starts at 11 p.m. The church is located at the corner of Thurlow and Pendrel. For more information, you can call 739-7959. The Cutting Edges Hockey Team presents a skating party. It's at the West End Community Center on Denman Street. It's at 10.30 p.m. on December the 29th. You can get your tickets at Little Sisters, Kim Prince, or at the door. Tickets are $10. They include skate rentals, and uh, it's a fundraiser for the Sydney Gay Games and the Dr. Peter Center. Girl Gig Productions presents a couple of dances, the first one being on December the 29th at the Wise Hall, the second one taking place at Tribeca at 536 Seymour Street. Tickets for both these events you can get at Little Sisters and at Coco Pelli Hair. TBB Productions presents Revelation. It's the biggest gay dance party. It's on December 31st at the Vogue Theatre. You can get your tickets at Little Sisters. The Vancouver Pride Society and Jeff Boy presents Jeff Boy New Year Dance Party. It's open until 3 a.m. It's on December 31st at 1250 Richard Street. You can get your tickets at Little Sisters and at Tech Direct. And on New Year's Day, there's a New Year's Day tea dance presented by Not So Strictly Ballroom. It's taking place from 3 till 8 p.m. at 927 Granville Street on the second floor. Tickets are available on a sliding scale and you could get more information by calling 684 Extra extension 2145. Now if there's an event or a story you want Outlook TV to cover, please fax us the information at 990-6114. You can call us on our line at 412-2661 or you could email us the information through our website at www.outlooktv.org. From all of us here at Outlook TV, we wish you and your loved ones a happy and safe holiday and all the best and peace in 2002. You'll never guess what I'm doing today. I'm having my hair and makeup done right here at the Lounge Hair Salon and Spa. Then, I'm going with a personal consultant who's going to dress me from head to toe with the latest, hottest winter and holiday fashions. Then, to top it all off, I'm going to have a pedicure and manicure. That's right, I get to be queen for a day. Well, basically what we're doing is give you a stronger look in the eyes and softer in the lips. But you can actually reverse that, go stronger in the lips and softer in the eyes. But if you want very dramatic kind of look for the whole evening, you can go strong on both eyes and lips together. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what are you going to do for me today? Today I'm going to give you a glamorous look with a more today's edge. So okay. I'm going to have it flipped out a little bit messy, but still more glamorous. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. That's what we're aiming for. Can't wait to okay. see Now I need to go shopping. Oh yeah, that's where we're gonna go. Vancouver has an incredibly diverse offering of fashion options. In downtown Vancouver, there are literally hundreds of great looking stores with everything from streetwear to evening wear and everything in between. I go through, I you know, analyze what they do for a living, what their looks are, what they like, and then we try to blend things together that are current in the season, that actually will work with their wardrobe as well, that will take them a little bit further working, traveling, you know, evenings, also, you know, going away for the weekend in the country. What do you think? 
Oh, I love it. I think it's awesome. This is exactly what we're looking for. If you're looking for streetwear, this is where it is. <laughs> right. Let's go. I think you look amazing. And now that you've got your hair and your makeup done, I think I know the perfect place to take you. Really? Let's go glam. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow around nine. Okay, bye-bye. Hello there. Hi. Gail, hi, I'm Sharon. It's nice to meet nice you. How Sharon. are you? Nice to meet you? Anthony, nice to meet you. Welcome to the private shopping suites at Holt Renfrew. We have some lovely things set aside for you. Ooh. This is the best that Holt Renfrew has to offer for the holiday season. Let's try it on. What do you think? You look amazing. I think we found the perfect outfit. I absolutely love this oh, stall. Adore it. It looks amazing on. But you know what? I think we should end your day with a manicure and pedicure at the absolute spot, Holt Renfrew. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony! Anthony, is there any more champagne? For Outlook TV, I'm Gail Anderson. Great play on at the Waterfront Theatre right now. The Falsettos is a Tony Award winning musical comedy about coming out, about being Jewish, and about falling in love. Who believed that we two would end up as lovers? Want me to reply? You and me, you and I, passionately lovers. Please don't get morbid. Right. What's the play about, Rick? Well, uh, it's a musical comedy uh, about a Jewish family. Marvin, his wife, and their 12-year-old son. And uh, Marvin has a male lover, and he wants them all to get along and live in the same house. They, uh, they all share the same psychiatrist. And um, in the second act, uh, there are two lesbian characters that are introduced. Uh, there are Marvin's friends who live next door. Here I am by your side, what old Lord, dear lover. Please go on and don't be scared. What's the fuss? I'm not scared. What good is a lover? Cool. What attracts Wizard to Marvin? Uh, they have like a volatile relationship, I think, and that's probably a lot of the attraction that, uh, that Wizard has to Marvin. You know, I think he enjoys the fight. I mean, it's certainly, I guess, in the material that that's part of their relationship is the the tug of war, I guess, the power struggle. Aside from that, I think it's probably just a standard relation. He's a, you know, presumably a pretty lovable guy and uh, handsome. So yeah, I think that's it. I, I, think, I don't think it's that, that strange a relationship, despite the fact that there's all kinds of crazy stuff involved. It's like the same baggage you have in any relationship, you know? Come, just go home and turn on TV. Drink some It's not about being gay. It's not about being Jewish. It's not about any of those things. It's not even about being in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, although it gives us a little distance so we can be comfortable with it. What it's about is just human interactions and the depth of feeling and so on. And I think what I love about doing the part is that we're, we're able to give homosexuals, um, lesbians and gay men, um, the opportunity to see themselves as just other people going through shit, going through life stuff. I feel, let's be scared together. Let's pretend that nothing is awful. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. Catch the falsettos until the 26th at the Waterfront Theatre, and the January 20th performance is a fundraiser for AIDS Vancouver.
thing about typo sketches is that it, it really builds on who we are in Vancouver. We see ourselves in it, you know? For, for a century or more, lesbians and gay men have come to a city and reinvented themselves. And that's what Christopher did, you know? He found out who he was, he did, and, and he explored his list on sexuality. And, and in the process, he discovered all new friends and a chosen family, and he found out what the real meaning of community was. Is there one of the characters that you personally relate to more than the others? Um, not really. I think each one of them has a certain facet that appeals to me, and that really taught me a lot over the year, you know? I mean, Tully is a character that just jumps in and does things and then thinks about them after. I think she was the one I learned from the most through the whole year. Tully dragged Christopher down the drive with all the grace of walking a cat on a leash. When they got to Venables, she dragged him into a store on the corner called Women's Wear. Toys were number 15 on the sex list, but it seemed fine to jump so far ahead. He wondered, what does one look for in a dildo? Size, bendability, taste? Looking over at the change room in the corner, he wondered if a smart consumer was meant to try these things out. Xander is the part of me that I never really want to admit is there, I guess, I don't know. And Christopher was the part of me that was 21 once, so, and still is sometimes. So every one of them, in some way, I identify with. Later that night, uptown, Xander had convinced himself that he didn't care if the others laughed at him. They had to go out to clubs and try to meet some careless strangers. Well, he got to stay in, watch Bridges of Madison County, while cuddling on 230 thread count sheets. <laughs> They cuddled, they cried, they cuddled some more. When the movie was over, Muscle Cuddle went off to the kitchen to get some juice for them, wearing his cute flannel pajamas. Somebody came up to me in the gym at the very beginning and told me that if Xander's heart got broken, he would kick my ass, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, very good feedback. In a lot of ways, the series is a bit of a fantasy space. It's a community that I don't think exists yet in Vancouver. Uh, a closeness between the women and the men, between the lesbians and the, and the gay men in the city. There's great potential for it here. It's kind of bringing the East End and the West End together somehow. Everyone wants to feel loved and valued. For some, being in an intimate relationship can provide the key to happiness and fulfillment. But finding this happiness often requires more than just love. And some therapists say that relationships are a complex blend of knowing who you are, respecting another person's needs, and looking at what obstacles there are and difficulties in a relationship. When men and women have relationship difficulties, usually it's because they don't understand each other's mm -hmm. way of thinking. Sure. Does this differ in lesbian couple relationships? Um, to some extent, yes, I think it does. Um, women <clears throat> have a tendency to be able to talk about their emotional world much easier than men and to share that uh, with one another. And so um, emotionally, um, there can be certainly a feeling of being understood. Also, two women together, there's a shared experience within the world that um, is understood. Um, by virtue of being lesbians in the world. Um, however, one of the difficulties with that is that there can be an assumption that I'm going to be understood by another woman. Um, and so any differences or conflicts that uh, arise in the relationship can be more difficult to address or deal with and, and can often go underground. When you run into a problem, does it benefit you both, that you're women? Can you understand each other better? Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. Well, not in our case, because I tend to speak like what guys. They're more quiet and more reserved, and they need to think about it before they, whereas women want to resolve everything right away. Well, not all women, because obviously I'm a woman, but I'm just, yeah, I've spent most of my life with guys, so just because I'm a woman, it doesn't mean I communicate like one. Women are... Um, traditionally taught to nurture others and deny their own needs. 
Um, so when two women come together, there can be often a, a hope on some level that now I'm going to be taken care of because this is uh, another woman. If both women are coming in with that hope and that desire, um, then they can, they can develop conflict around whose needs are being taken care of. And it's about uh, dealing with difference, and again, and dealing with uh, conflict and negotiating conflict. Well, initially it was just that we got along like a house on fire and that was great, and then, and then we started to have a few a few differences and we've managed to work those out and uh, realized that we had very different communication styles so we've had to do a lot of work on that and I think that as much as anything is what helps keep you together is figuring out a way to communicate and having to overcome a few obstacles I mean if it was all easy then if something came up it would be you know devastating but because it hasn't been all easy we've overcome the little things and kept them from becoming huge things a lot of the problems that couples face can be easily resolved by talking to a therapist who can help clarify and identify why the couple are experiencing the issues at hand. Oh, the main challenges, I'd say uh, mostly communication, uh, managing to find ways to communicate because we seem to come from very different models of communication and so finding the middle ground that we, can, that we both feel comfortable with, that would, be, that would be our biggest challenge I think, yeah. Well, we did it the hard way at first, that uh, Cindy tends not to communicate, whereas I tend to talk everything to death and, and want it, you know, carved in stone that, okay, we have solved this issue. <laughs> and uh, so I guess what we, what we ended up doing was that I would chase her around a little at first and say, no, we have to finish talking about this. And uh, it took quite a few mis misunderstandings first to find the, the way that we work best and a lot of negotiation. <laughs> There's an assumption, if I'm in a relationship with a woman, it's going to be an equal relationship, right? And nothing is ever equal. So that <clears throat> when um, differences in power and inequalities are felt in the relationship, that can either be heightened uh, and create a lot of conflict or, again, goes underground. We have things in common, but the things we don't, we accept about each other as well. So sh we can be in the same room and we'll be close to each other, but we can be doing different things and it's all good as long as we get to spend a lot of time with each other and we get to spend like our separate time as well. So you always have something new to bring to the relationship. So what do you think women should think about before they get into a relationship? I guess they should think about what men and women should think about before they get into relationships. Know yourself, know what you want, know what you need, because if you don't, you're just going to confuse the other person and you're going to confuse yourself. So you have to look at yourself and then look at what you need and then hopefully find somebody who fulfills those needs for you. Well said. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
simply the act of making an appointment to speak to the, the counselor is positive because it means that the guys still have some hope that the problems can get better. Uh, so what the counselor can do is build on that um, still remaining goodwill between them. It just was great to hear these, this, this other set of you know, ideas about maybe what Larry was trying to say to me or what I was trying to say to him. We weren't headed for a breakup, but we certainly were in a bit of a void. We were in new territory and we didn't know what to do. And, and I know that our relationship is much better. And probably that's why we're together now, because we decided to get a little help with figuring out what came next, I think. Good boy. Men and women, including gays and lesbians, are socialized differently. Um, and that affects their, their relationships. Um, men uh, are encouraged to be independent, autonomous, at the expense of, of being good at in intimacy, while women, um, they are encouraged to define themselves in terms of their relationships with others, and they spend less time thinking about independence. The therapist actually suggested that I invite Gary along, and, and um, I guess, um, it was felt that, that our relationship was an issue that we needed to discuss. So it switched from my career to my relationship. And it worked out very well for us. Um, after, oh, I, I guess about six months of seeing the therapist, we ended up deciding to, to get married. Larry knew that it was time to talk to somebody, just to sort out some of the, the issues that, that he was feeling. Therapy sessions reveal how each person has either contributed or contaminated the relationship and whether they wish to continue or change this behavior in the future. Two people can only go so far without some third party sort of helping them out. Research says that lesbians probably are better at relationships than gay men. They, they find partners more easily and they also stay in relationships longer. But what they struggle with is maintaining their sense of separate identity. Well, what gay men will struggle with, I think, is, um, I mean, these are very broad generalizations, but, but um, disengagement, so they may not be communicating that well. They may be focusing maybe a little more than is healthy for the relationship on, um, on outside pursuits, sometimes outside sexual pursuits. Women maybe need to be focusing a little more on those pursuits because they're so wrapped up with their partner. So th those are some differences. In Vancouver, I'm Gail Anderson. Health in the City is a one-day conference bringing together leading investigators as well as policymakers to try to focus on the inner city urban health issues, especially HIV drug users. I'm one of the organizers of Health in the City, the first chaos conference on urban health research, which is probably the first conference of its kind in Canada, uh, bringing together researchers from across North America with policymakers and community representatives uh, to look at the emerging issues of urban health research. And this deals with people, uh, some of our most marginalized uh, populations in Canada, um, inner city residents, uh, injection drug users, uh, Aboriginal uh, residents of the city, uh, street youth, um, uh, urban poor uh, women, groups that are in many ways uh, not accessing health care and uh, enjoying the sort of health that the broader population does. I work at Johns Hopkins University in the School of Public Health, which is an academic institution, and my own personal mission is to put myself out of a job. I'm trying to prevent HIV infections and reduce the burden of HIV and AIDS in, in the population. We've been following about 3,000 injection drug users since 1988, and we were looking at risk factors for HIV infection, and we um, suspected that we would see different risk factors in the women versus the men. And um, a somewhat surprising finding was that the strongest predictor of HIV seroconversion for men was 
engaging in homosexual activity. And uh, this means that men who are having sex with men who are also injection drug users, they're at dual risk of HIV infection because they're often doubly stigmatized from the communities that they live in. There are some theories uh, around the overlap between men who have sex with men and men who inject drugs. And some of that is being addressed today at the Health in the City conference um, around uh, that specific population of men who have sex with men who also inject drugs. And there are a, a subpopulation in both the gay community and the injection drug use community that hasn't been well looked at in the past. Uh, most recently, our, uh, our findings last year, we found that the um, incidence rates, the HIV incidence rates, were fairly stable between 1996 and 1999. And then in the year 2000, we found quite a jump. We found that an increase of about five-fold in the infection rate within our cohort. And we were quite surprised at that because we weren't able to document any particular change in the population. We weren't seeing in an increase in risk behavior. Uh, there was nothing to really explain that increase in HIV rates. Well, it could be that, that men who are having sex with men that also inject drugs um, hang out with other men who have the same characteristics and that um, if they're having sex with each other, um, it, it may not be protected and they may be more likely to share needles under those circumstances and, um, and may share a, you know, a common bond because they feel so you know, marginalized from, from the community that they live in. I think that the answers usually lie in the community themselves. Uh, I think that, that um, HIV positive gay men who have watched their friends die uh, you know, have rallied around this cause from the beginning and many have, have changed their behaviors. And I think that what we need to do is, is um, involve them in some of the prevention planning for some of the HIV negative men and, and support staying negative. During AIDS education, young people seem to suffer from AIDS fatigue. No matter how many times they've heard the safe sex message, they seem to ignore it. It's, it's a very easy answer to say, well, education has failed, but I don't really believe that, that education has been tried to its, its full, full potential. We've never really made a concerted effort to educate young gay and bisexual men. There's never been a national campaign in this country targeting HIV prevention education at young gay and bisexual men. There's, it's always been piecemeal, ad hoc basis across the country. Well, I think we do need more education, and I think that some of the advertising that the pharmaceutical companies have portrayed AIDS um, and HIV positive people who are taking you know, antiretrovirals as you know, climbing mountains and being the buff bods and all that. That's, that, it's nice, but it's got a double-edged sword. It's, it's the, and the edge on that sword is that, well, you know, HIV is, is just like getting the flu, and, and, and it's not that. It's a lot more complicated. As policymakers and medical professionals struggle to deliver health care, the answers to the problem still seems to be in the education of the community. I'm Fred Camperman with Outlook TV. Point front, plie, back, plie, front, back, front, close in first, jeté, jeté, jeté. I went over in 1964 at the invitation of two ballerinas and uh, was able to spend a year as an apprentice and that really gave me a technical basis for my whole career, which ended very early with a knee injury. But I was luckily, now, luckily invited back to take the teacher's course. Shoulders down, down, head over here, Michael. Plie. They go so slowly that it becomes natural. And that's why it looks so fabulous. Coordination that you turn the head and the hand at the same time. And, so that it all flows. It's nothing is separate. It's all a harmonious movement of the body. One, two, three. Now to the side. One, close. I came back. I had a school in Mexico. I was partners in a big school. We had 250 kids, and I was diagnosed HIV positive. So naturally, um, the medical situation, and there's no social support in Mexico, I came straight home where I knew that I would get the best treatment. And I came home, luckily, just at the time of the big AIDS conference in 95 or 6, I don't remember which year, where they had made some breakthroughs with medication. And I immediately went on the drug cocktail, taking three types of drugs, four, in fact. And uh, my viral load became undetectable, and my C counts, which is your immune system, 
signals, very high, like a normal person. So um, deciding that I wasn't going to die right away, because that's what you think when you first get diagnosed, I thought I'd better do something. And somebody on the board, uh, Bo LeDru of, of British Columbia Persons with AIDS Society, was also on the board here of the gathering place. And he said, we have a ballet studio there. What are you doing? Why don't you come? and use it. Ian came to us with the idea of a ballet class and uh, there was an interest so it was one that we put on and it's been going on for um, quite a while now and it's, it's um, not something that we were expecting would be popular and has been and so it's been a good surprise. Well, I gain a lot of uh, physical fitness, um, and I'm particularly interested in uh, all the core stability that it gives me, the ability to stand on one leg um, and lift my leg up. Uh, actually, it benefits my whole sense of well-being. It makes me really good at martial arts, too, so all those tough people that uh, think that ballet isn't uh, you know, something for them, uh, they might want to think again, because it's uh, an incredible exercise. People that are studying kung fu, karate, and martial arts, are looking in and saying, maybe I could use that for my kick. And they get in here and they get fascinated by how actually demanding it is and how great you feel afterwards. Piki, good. Front, back, front, back, two. It was incredible, like just the attention that he pays to the tiniest little details, like what you're doing with your head and with your hand all at the same time. So. Uh, we're getting the same kind of attention that uh, somebody would get in a master class, uh, but it's in a casual setting. It's great. Hi, I'm Fred Camperman, and we're here with Outlook TV and the Pacific Rim Curling League. The league was uh, formed 19 years ago. Um, a bunch of guys got together and decided that uh, curling was a pastime for them when they were younger and they wanted to have a, a gay and lesbian outlet uh, for curling. So they formed a league of, I believe it was about six teams back then, and now over the years it's grown to a league of 32 teams, which of course consists of uh, four members each, so over 120 members uh, in our league at the current time. It's good to have other people who are like yourself, gay or lesbian, that, uh, that can get together in a comfortable and uh, safe atmosphere and uh, do the sport that you enjoy. The Pacific Rim Curling League hosted the 19th Annual Bonds Field with teams from all over Canada participating. We spoke to Jerry George, one of the organizers. We have teams here from London, Ontario, from Edmonton, from Calgary, from Sa Saskatoon, um, as well as uh, 20 teams from Vancouver, from our own league. And bond spills are one of those things where in curling it's, it's a, an event that you usually hold all throughout the year at different times. It gets people together. Each of the, the gay organizations in Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton, they all have um, curling, curling events and they all have a bond spill and a lot of the teams rotate throughout all of the different events as well. Can you tell us about the trophies? We have a trophy for what we call the Old Bart Straw to the Button, which is uh, an event that we put, donate money to, to the Loving Spoonful. And then we have another prestigious award that we sort of pick somebody throughout the weekend who is the most precious princess of the weekend. Now, have you yourself ever won this award? Um, no, uh, I was kind of worried about it this year because I did do a couple of things that would have put me in that sort of um, frame, but I think I've got away with a thank you to my teammate. If you'd like more information on Pacific Rim Curling League, contact them through their website. For Outlook TV, I'm Fred Camperman. I'm Carol Delinko, and you're watching Out in the City. We'd like to welcome everybody who's come up for the 10th Annual Gay and Lesbian Ski Week in Whistler. All kinds of events happening up on the slopes from February 2nd straight through the 11th. You can find out more information from the number listed here, or contact them on their website at www.outontheslopes.com.
If you're not heading up to Whistler, there are events in town. In fact, this weekend is a lesbian Valentine tryst happening at Heritage Hall. There's a wonderful message booth for single women, door prizes, and all proceeds going to Port Coquitlam Women's Center. Tickets are $14 in advance at Little Sisters or $17 at the door. For men at Sonar on Saturday night, Inside is happening. It's a mixed up, dirty, and serious party for the guys. Tickets available at the door. Sunday, February 10th, down at Bar Nun on Hamilton Street, All the Queen's Men is going to be happening. That's a fantastic drag queen and drag king show with great performances and dancing afterwards. Tickets are $5 in advance, available from Little Sisters or Tech Direct, or available at the door for $7. As well, later on in the month, February 17th, you're not going to want to miss Two Funny Girls with Susan Westenhofer and Janice Ungaro. Tickets for this are $22 in advance from Ticketmaster or Little Sisters or Women in Print or $25 at the door if available. Out West Performance Society has monthly readings of gay and lesbian plays. If you're interested in performing or going to the readings, make sure you contact them at the number listed here or via their email address. As well, the Davie Business Street Association would like to congratulate Joe Average on his winning design for the new banners that will be appearing in the early spring down on Davie Street. If you have an event or a listing that you would like us to mention on Out in the City, please be sure that you contact us via our website, www.outlooktv.org, or via the phone numbers listed here. For Out in the City on Outlook TV, I'm Carol Delinko. A growing number of lesbian couples are choosing to adopt or conceive their own child. But what are some of the difficulties and challenges they face? First you would come to Genesis and um, oftentimes we try to schedule various appointments into one day so it's not too overwhelming. Um, typically your first appointment would be seeing a physician and that appointment really uh, entails a discussion really about um, any kind of medical um, difficulties or history that would preclude um, one's fertility that would cause a problem um, in, in her treatment here. Thereafter couples would come and meet with me and uh, that discussion really involves sort of um, mulling over some of the, the bigger issues um, which couples confront when they're considering pursuing parenthood. Um, we talk, for example, about donor selection and what couples are looking for um, in the way of a donor. We discuss uh, the kind of preparing oneself emotionally um, for the actual treatment process and for the ups and downs and possible disappointments that come with that. And we also talk about longer term issues. Um, this issues like disclosure. Um, do you disclose to the child? And if so, when, how? Um, what does that all look like down the road? Um, what do we know about how well these children adjust to living um, uh, in, in um, lesbian-headed ho homes, um, whether it be an individual um, or a couple? What about the children, though? Like, do you think they suffer later in life being made fun of or stuff like that? Not at all. I'm, I'm a product of partially that. Um, my father and his boyfriend were kind of one side of my family and my mother and her boyfriend were the other side of my family and I might have suffered, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Depending on people. I don't know. I think it can be, I, c I think it can help. Definitely just to grow up in different ways and know before you get out in the world that there's different ways that families can manage. And I think it helped me a lot. That's how small the Genesis Fertility is. Clinic orders screen samples from various so approved sperm banks in Canada and in the U.S. Um, most people are surprised at the amount of information they do get about the donor, his medical history, his family medical history, um, as well as, of course, physical characteristics and interests and occupation. Each donor sample costs $350, and then there is an additional charge for the laboratory work of thawing and preparing the sample, and for the nurse to do the insemination is $125 when uh, the patient comes in. 
for the insemination. So a total of $475 for each attempt. Nice. Lesbian couples almost always disclose to their child yes. that an unknown donor was involved. Most of the couples that we see are uh, planning on telling the child or children, as, as the case may be, the nature of their genetic origins. Um, but how that happens and when that happens uh, is, is a whole other issue that we will often discuss at length. You have to disclose fully, really. That, I mean, everybody needs to know everything about how they were raised, how they were brought up, how they came to us, what process we went through, everything, everything. I'll tell them everything. There's nothing I, I won't tell them. In Vancouver for Outlook TV, I'm Gail Anderson. In part one of Not Without My Child, we looked at the process of conceiving a child. In part two, we will look at the difficulties and challenges lesbian couples face adopting children. How do you feel about same-sex couples adopting children? Um, I don't have a problem with it. As long as people love their kids and they can provide a good home. I think it's a good idea. I think as long as you have two parents that love children, um, it's hard to do it by yourself. And I think to having two people, and especially if they're in a good, committed relationship. Well, with all due respect to same couples, I think that uh, they made a choice when they actually became same couples, uh, the same sex couples. And you got to give up certain rights when you make certain decisions. That's life. <laughs> Three cups of water, okay? Originally, we registered with the Ministry of Children and Families in 1996 and got nowhere with that. Um, we didn't get a home study done from them. They didn't call us. So uh, I phoned the Vancouver office, and the woman on the phone was dreadful to me. And I, the first thing she, she said was, you wouldn't want to adopt any of our children which I, I was just horrified. And I, I told a number of people this reaction because at the same time, the Ministry of Children and Families was advertising for families. So um, I said, well, you don't know that. And she said, well, we only have special needs children. Our first call to the ministry was about two and a half years ago. And the social worker that I talked to basically said, our kids have problems and they need normal families. The implication was that we were not a normal family. Um, she said if we were willing to take a severely disabled child, then perhaps we could adopt. And I said, yes, I, I understand that. And uh, we've done some research into special needs. And there are some special needs that we'd be, we would be willing to um, look at. It looks like yeah. the pig's trying to get in the bag. Yeah. In 97, we met another lesbian couple who had successfully adopted through a private agency in the United States. And so we decided to follow what they did. So we got in touch with a, an agency in Victoria, private agency, had them do our home study. And then we registered at the agency in Philadelphia. And by February of 98, we adopted our son. And he's four today. When we were looking for our, to adopt the second child, we weren't sure that we were going to go with the same agency. Um, just to see if there was somewhere local, somewhere less expensive, the U.S. dollar being what it is right now. So we were looking around and uh, to make it quicker, what I would do on the phone when I contacted an agency is I said, we're a lesbian couple from Canada, can you deal with us? And it was either no or yes. About a year later, they had a big campaign for adoptive children in British Columbia. There was so many of them needing homes and that they really campaigned for adoptive families. And so that's when I called again um, and took my chance that I wouldn't get such a negative response the second time. And I didn't at all. I felt completely supported since then in this decision. Totally. I think I just hit the wrong social worker, which is easy to do, unfortunately. We anticipated some reaction from people uh, either, you know, what what are you Caucasian people doing with those black kids or what are you women with that boy because our, our first child was is a, a boy or what are you lesbians doing with kids in the first place or anything at all like that and I, I was all ready with all my answers and nobody ever said boo 
Everybody's been thrilled. And that was, that was a surprise more than anything, I guess. Our, our families embraced the children and our neighbors um, were very supportive and very positive and our friends, you know, our, our children have lots of aunties and uncles and people to spend time with. These kids aren't by accident. We have been scrutinized by the, home, by the um, adoption agency here yes. and the adoption agency in Philadelphia and uh, Canada Immigration and Revenue Canada and you know, there's pretty much nothing that people haven't asked us. So the kids might as well hear it first off because everybody sort of knows the whole story. In Vancouver for Outlook TV, I'm Gail Anderson. A growing number of lesbian couples are choosing to adopt or conceive their own child. But what are some of the difficulties and challenges they face? How do you feel about same-sex couples adopting children? I think it's okay. I do, uh... I think they can raise a baby just as good as a two-sex couple, different sex. I think it's a good idea. I think as long as you have two parents that love children, um, it's hard to do it by yourself. And I think having two people, and especially if they're in a good, committed relationship. Well, with all due respect to same couples, I think that uh, they made a choice when they actually became same couples, uh, the same sex couples. And you got to give up certain rights when you make certain decisions. That's life. So I, th I don't think that's proper. Barbara Finley represents lesbian couples through the adoption process and recently won a landmark case that prevents the ministry from denying applications on the basis of sexual orientation. Any, any person or any two people, including any two lesbians or any two gay men, can adopt a child in British Columbia. That's been the law since 1994, I believe. BC is one of the most progressive provinces in Canada, if not the world, in recognizing same-sex couples as adoptive parents. Most of the laws that govern relationships are provincially established, and British Columbia is the most progressive jurisdiction in Canada, and um, one of the two or three most progressive jurisdictions in the world. Oh, yes, the law has changed enormously for lesbian co-mums. The first biggest change, of course, was when lesbians could together adopt a child. Lesbian co-moms are regarded as co-moms by the law. Now, that sometimes that's true, even if you didn't actually think of yourself as a co-mom. Because if you've been living with a lesbian and supporting her child, then after a period of time, you acquire an obligation, a legal obligation, as a step-parent, so that if you break up, you'll be liable to pay maintenance on behalf of the child and you'll also have the right of access to the child. Just as you would if you were in a heterosexual relationship. Lesbian couples are now both recognized on a birth certificate as co-parents. When the child is born, actually, the two co-mums can register as parents on the birth certificate. That didn't used to be possible, but um, it used to be the case that if Vital Statistics got a registration application that had the names of two women on it, they'd send it back and say, sorry, we only deal with, basically, we only deal with men as the second co-parent. And we took a human rights complaint and we said, hey, wait a minute. If birth mum and male partner have a child by assisted insemination so that the child is not biologically related to her partner, you don't reject that. If the application comes in with, with her partner's name on it as the father, you don't even know. You can't tell the difference. So you can't reject our application. That's discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. If you want to do the adoption yourself, you can. You can go to the courthouse, pick up the forms, fill them out, yeah. get somebody to take your... Uh, you have to swear documents, yes. so you have to get them sworn before a notary, but really that's it. Um, if you need legal help with that or want legal help because you don't want to be bothered to do all that by yourself, then you would consult a lawyer such as me. That's for a step-parent adoption. Uh, if you're adopting the child of 
someone who is not you or your partner, a stranger adoption or an international adoption, then there's more paperwork, it's more complicated, and it's way easier to have a lawyer. In Vancouver for Outlook TV, I'm Gail Anderson. A lot of gay men seem to think that HIV is yesterday's problem. They figure if I get HIV, no problem. They've got a cocktail for that, right? Wrong! The cocktail is no picnic. Chronic diarrhea, body fat distortion, depression, this is what goes along with the cocktail. And this is why AIDS Vancouver's gay men's health programs have initiated a multimedia campaign to remind us all, wear a condom. This campaign is called Arouse. And the point of the campaign really is to uh, arouse discussion, debate in the gay community once again around the concept of uh, HIV and how, 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 how the gay community has been living with it for the last 20-some uh, you know, years and how we're going to continue to live with it. The uh, community, from our perspective, has totally been lulled into a false sense of security by, uh, by the advent of the new combination therapies, the, uh, the HIV cocktail. And so the other the other objective of this campaign, um, as, as entitled, sort of like arouse, first is to arouse debate. The second is really to using HIV treatment optimism, the concept that with HIV treatments, everything is going to be okay. So using the concept of HIV treatment optimism to actually get at some of the, uh, the, the realities that people face who are on the treatments. One for the HIV. Two for the vomiting from the one for the HIV. Three for the runs from the two for the vomiting from the one for the HIV. Four for the liver damage from the five for the nutrients lost to the vomiting from the one for the HIV. Then comes the afternoon. Then comes every day for the rest of your life. Use of condoms goes down, incidence of HIV goes up, duh. Let's turn this thing around. Wear a condom. For information on the Arouse campaign, check aidsvancouver.bc.ca. I'm Larry Colsey at the Royal Pub in Vancouver for Outlook TV. This is Out in the City, and these are the upcoming events for the week. A musical celebration called Unison 2002 is happening at Christ Church Cathedral on Saturday, February 23rd at 7.30 p.m. All kinds of vocal groups will be there, including the Vancouver Women's Chorus, the Rainy City Gay Men's Chorus, the Rainbow Concert Band, Vancouver Gay and Lesbian Choir, as well as the Vancouver Men's Chorus. If you're interested in going to this, tickets are available at the door for $20 or available at Little Sisters, Women in Print, or David Blue Hair. Should be a great and fun event. A literary reading will be taking place at Little Sisters and Gareth Kirkby, the managing editor of Extra West, as well as a past winner of the Jack Webster Award of Distinction. He's going to be reading from a great selection of works. That's happening on February 21st at 7 p.m., again at Little Sisters. For the theater event in town this coming week, Bash is going to be happening. These are three dramatic vignettes by playwright Neil Labute that discuss homophobia. Partial proceeds of this will be going to the Aaron Webster Fund. That's going to be until February 23rd at Havana Cafe on Commercial Drive, and tickets are $12 at Little Sisters. As well, Out West Performance Society is hosting monthly reading of gay and lesbian plays, so make sure you take part in all of these events. Lezzy Bolarama is happening on Saturday, February 23rd at 8 p.m. at the Grandview Bowling Lanes. The Women Warriors softball team is actually putting on this fundraiser to raise funds for the Sydney Gay Games this coming November. Tickets are available at Little Sisters, Sophie's Pet Palace, and Women in Print for $15. And again, it is on February 23rd at Grandview Bowling Lanes. If you have an event that you would like us to mention, please feel free to contact us at the numbers listed here or via our website, www.outlooktv.org. I'm Carol Delinko for Outlook TV. You've been watching Out in the City. HIV and AIDS is on the rise, and it can be prevented. It's called a condom. Sex can be a very spontaneous act, and so there's no condoms there. There's this desire for intimacy, and some people feel that a condom is a barrier to intimacy. So it's overcoming 
You have to overcome the sense of that being a barrier to intimacy. Uh, condoms can be fun. Uh, they require a good sense of humor. Uh, at this point in this uh, disease, I would say use condoms all the time, every time, even though people hate that message. I think that sex and risk are hardwired into the brain. And uh, so until you become more aware of, of accepting the fact that you are risking sexually, you may us into people's sexual lives that, that needs to be happening. When you look at HIV and you look at AIDS, what is one thing that you would want anybody out there who's sexually active, especially gay men, especially drug users, what's one thing you would want them to know um, sort of firsthand? That HIV is not an easy virus to catch, but it is still out there and it's causing a lot of alarm for people who are looking at it because it's not going away, it is still a problem. Even though they have medications for it, their medications have com complex uh, reactions to them. It's not easy. Taking pills every day for the rest of your life is not a treat. We think of it as being a treatable disease. However, we don't know for how long. The Vanguard Project is one of two organizations currently using the HIV rapid test to test for okay. HIV infection. Uh, you've asked for a rapid HIV test, and I just want to refer to a couple of things. Remember, it's good for all of your life up to three months ago. The rapid test is as reliable as the blood serum test that is most available. It uh, involves a finger prick. Might a little. Uh, and uh, taking Maybe a little blood much. drop. You tell me if it's, <laughs> if it's going to hurt very much. going to feel a little prick. Did that hurt? No, that's it. That's it. What I say is that it's good for all of your life up to three months ago, 98% of the time, if it's a negative. If it's a positive test result, then we consider it to be a preliminary test result and you want to take another blood sample to be absolutely sure that that's the correct reading. If somebody comes in for the Vanguard project and they've had high risk and they don't have any support, I may choose to say I'd rather do a blood serum test on you than that. Normally, what does it take for the, if uh, they go into the About uh, two weeks. 10 days to two weeks if you just have an ordinary uh, blood serum draw. So somebody could know within 15 to 20 minutes up until three months ago in their life if they were um, HIV neg positive. Neg no, if they were negative. If they were negative. Yes. If they were positive, you'd have a confirmatory blood test. Okay. That could take up to two days. Your test result is done. It's got your initials on it. And you can see it has the single bar. What is the single bar? Mean? The single bar means that there were no antibodies found. So that's a non-reactive. You don't have HIV, and it's good for all of your life up to three months ago. If you've had any risk in the last three months, this won't necessarily cover it. You've been doing this for seven years, and you keep pioneering on. What makes you keep going? Well, I think because knowledge helps people. The more informed people are, the better their choices are going to be. I really do believe that. For Outlook TV, I'm Richard Ferguson. John Crossan is a fabulous cartoonist who has his uh, cartoon in Extra West, the Cross in the Line. And today we're here at the Urban Hair Gallery on 332 West Cordova, which is his big exposition. And uh, John, can you tell us about it? Well, my, uh, this is my first exposition, and I'm having a great time. There's loads of people here. People are buying stuff off the walls, and uh, it's really, really a lot of work and really, really a lot of fun. When did you start drawing? Well, I started drawing as early as I can possibly remember. I, I would say, well, two, three. There's still markings all over my mother's walls in the basement, and I never stopped since then. And when do you feel that your career really took off as a cartoonist? 
when I decided to dump the career that I had for 20 years of being plants, flowers, and display queen, which I did all over town in the hotels and the convention centers and giant weddings and whatever. So I decided to take my hobby and turn it into my career and take my career and turn it into a hobby. And what was your big break? When was the big turning point that you became, what you consider, the starting point of your career? I would say, um, well, I've been doing the cartoons for the paper for five years, but that wouldn't be a big break. I would say I really made the decision two years ago and had a really good year doing nothing but creative projects. I don't just do cartoons. What else do you do? I do uh, a lot of flash animation now, other animations for the internet. I do three-dimensional stuff. I do... Uh, <laughs> Look around, t-shirts, uh, just about anything creative, some art direction, um, proposals, anything I can think of, rendering, storyboards. Now, do you consider yourself a gay cartoonist or you don't like to be pigeonholed that way? Well, I have become more of a gay cartoonist because I used to do a, bl a bunch of straight papers as well, local papers and things, but I decided that it was a lot of work, not a lot of money, and I, I thought that it might be wiser to focus on being a gay cartoonist because it's a much smaller market. There's only, from what I can see on the internet, maybe 180 cartoonists listed out there. Most of them are doing strips. I do a single panel usually. And um, it just seems better, though I don't know that I want to be pigeonholed as just a gay cartoonist. So what kind of advice would you give to a young, gay, struggling cartoonist who's wondering, should they or shouldn't they? Do it. Just do it, and do it from your heart, and do it as much as you can, and send it to every single newspaper you can find, and don't be afraid to just keep bugging them. That's what I do. If you want to see more of John's fabulous work, check out the website on the bottom of your screen. For Outlook TV, I'm Fred Camperman. Welcome to Outlook TV, TV for the gay, lesbian, transgendered and bisexual community. I'm Giovanni and here's what's happening in our community for the next couple of weeks. The 30 Helens Cabaret are holding monthly concerts at the Wise Hall at 1882 Adenac. You can get your tickets at the door, which are $15. And to get dates and times, please call 604-684-EXTRA, extension 2333. Not, not So Strictly Ballroom presents Latin and Swing Dance on March 2nd at 8 p.m. It's at the Let's Dance Studio on the second floor at 927 Granville Street. Tickets are available on a sliding scale at Little Sisters. The Cutting Edges Hockey Team presents Score 2. It's a skating party and dance on March 2nd at 9 p.m. at the West End Community Center. You can pick up your tickets at Little Sisters, Kim Prince, and at Gay Mart. Uh, the price of the tickets includes skate rentals, and after you've done some skating, DJ Quest will be spinning the tunes until 2 a.m. It's a fundraiser for the Dr. Peter Center and the Gay Games, and for more information, you can call 604-684-EXTRA, extension 2081. And for women who like women, there's Honey Bee Saturdays at the Lotus Hotel at 455 Abbott Street. If you want some more information, you could call 604-685-7777. Now, if there's an event that you want our viewers to know about, you can fax it to us at 604-990-6114, or you could email it to us by checking out our website at www.outlooktv.org. I'm Giovanni for Outlook TV. may very well be easier to come out today than it was a generation or two ago, but for many the prospect of telling your friends and family that you're different, that you're gay, is still very frightening. Two local theatre companies are currently doing plays that explore the barriers that prevent us from coming out and the relief that many of us feel when we do. Out West Performance Society is continuing its series of gay script readings this Sunday night. Coming out is such an interesting term, and I'm not sure how. And I mean, I use it, and I'm comfortable with it. It's going into yourself and coming to understand yourself, to know yourself, to acknowledge yourself. I'm not the varsity football champ, but they're so lucky I turned out. And they're, you know, they're very proud. My brother, he's fine with it, you know. He's totally just, you know, a heterosexual white kid. And I don't know, he's really cool, so... Again, though, like, I don't talk about it with them. You know, stories of sex and anything to do with... Everything else is the same. Our salon series has been happening monthly since November, first Sunday of the month, 
and April will be the last of the Play Salon series. Uh, we had to cancel the February one because we lost our venue less than 48 hours before the Salon, so this month we are moving to Launder Dog on Davie Street. We have two scripts being presented. One is the full script called I'm Gay Basically by Daniel Nyman and Stephen Sheffer. It's actually based on a series of interviews about coming out. And what's happened is the monologues get interspersed and we have four men telling their stories about coming out. One of the issues that I have coming out is that it implies that being gay is something special, something extraordinary. It's not. It's everyday life. Why do you think that um, men and women hesitate to come out or put it off, or why? The, the basic problem is fear. Um, society still hasn't reached the point where it just openly accepts every gay person. And in particular, coming out to family is always one of the most difficult things because it's where most of us feel like we're taking the biggest gamble. In Norman Is That You, a play that opens at the Terry Fox Theatre this week, a father struggles to come to terms with his own feelings when his son comes out to him. Dad, what the hell are you getting so excited about? Wait till you got a son who's a homosexual and then you'll know how it feels. Norman, tell me it's not true. All I know is that I am what I am and that's that. And I say you're not what you are and that's that. Norman, have you tried going to a doctor? Why should I? I'm perfectly happy. How can you be happy without a woman? A lot of people are. Can you please just try and be understanding for once in your life? Well, so that's it. I'm not understanding. I knew it. I'm to blame. It's not a matter of blame. There's no one to blame, Dad. Some people are different, that's all. Who are you to say that it's wrong? For performance details and ticket information, check our website, outlooktv.org. For Outlook TV, I'm Larry Colsey. New federal legislation now requires that same-sex couples essentially out themselves on their tax forms and declare their partnership. That's why the Centre on Butte Street has put together an information pamphlet and a seminar series to explain the impact. The Centre developed a series called uh, Rightfully Proud. It's a series of both pamphlets and legal seminars that we're doing and it's to inform uh, both lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual people about their rights under both federal and provincial law in BC. Effective 2001, same-sex couples now are required by law to file uh, income tax um, returns indicating that they're common law partners. So it's mandatory and a lot of people just aren't aware what that means for them. The question is, will this newfound equality hit us all in the pocketbook? The people that this is going to impact the most um, in an unfavorable way are the people who have children or the people who have been earning less than $30,000 a year. And the reason for this is that many of our social programs are income dependent. The higher your family income, the lower the benefit that you receive. So programs that that applies to are the GST tax credit, the child tax benefit, the old age supplement. The biggest advantage is for those people who will be contributing to their RRSPs or who have been contributing to their RRSPs. Significantly, in the event of a partner passing away, there's an opportunity for the RRSP to transfer on death tax-free to the surviving spouse. I would make a general statement that our new equality is costing those of us who can least afford it money. For those of us who can afford it, those of us who have RRSPs or who have income in excess of $30,000, it is to our advantage for this equality to take place. I think one of the things that this new legislation, well it's not new legislation, but this new, that, that this is going to impact is the way that we think about our relationships financially. In the past we have been encouraged by law and within our communities to consider our finances separately. By now having us report as spouses on our income tax return, there are many circumstances where we will have to consider ourselves a family unit and that's going to result in us having to combine our finances in a way that we haven't had to in the past. So we may end up having some discussions with, with each other that we haven't had. <laughs> yes, we're going to have some difficult discussions with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's important to realize that the legislation will provide equality for us in the same way that um, e equality with heterosexual couples. Um, but in the short term, that's going to cost us money. But in the long term, I think it's to the benefit of us all. For details on other seminars in this series, check our website. It's www.outlooktv.org. For Outlook TV, I'm Larry Colsey. 
If you've ever found yourself humming You're the one that I want or hopelessly devoted to you or Grease Lightning, get yourself down to Pacific Cinema Tech for out on screen's Grease Sing Along. Well, we're here at uh, Pacific Cinema Tech and we're doing the Grease Sing Along, and it's for out on screen. And what it is, is it's uh, the traditional movie Grease, the 1970 movie with John Travolta and uh, Olivia Newton John, who I had a crush on. But don't, don't tell anybody that. You can't, you never know. What's the sing along part? Well, the sing along is all the, the musical parts of the uh, movie have been uh, dubbed with the words. So the audience will have the words right up there on the screen and they can sing along. And we're going to do, we're going to do boy, girl parts because so much of it is a male, female sort of sharing musical. This Grease Sing Along is the first time that we've had an opportunity to work with Shaw. They're providing, Shaw's providing all the prizing for the 7th, 8th, 14th, and 16th. Free cable connection, three months digital box rental, and three months of Pride Vision TV. I think Pride Vision TV and Shaw need to work together because the community's got this thing going that somehow, because of what happened last year with the CRTC and all that stuff, we're done with that. We really want people to connect with Shaw. Obviously, it's the only way that they can watch Pride Vision TV. So it's a great partnership for us. And of course, I have my big pointer. Sex sells. It may not be thick, but my mother always said longer was better or something. Drew, the Grease Sing Along is a fundraiser for Out On Screen. Can you tell me how it fits in with the greater scheme of things? Well, I guess we're sort of um, calling it our spring benefit with the festival coming up in August. It's an opportunity to uh, get the word out about the festival this year, August 8th to 18th. And also an opportunity for us to uh, to raise a little bit of uh, dollars to help us with our efforts in putting together the festival for this year. And it should be a lot of fun. I don't know if you've watched Grease lately, but it's total camp, so we thought it was a good fit. What's your favorite song? Um, well, I have to say, Stranded at the Drive-In is one of my favorite songs. So what's your favorite song? I don't, I don't know. I really you don't know. Been no, one of these no, songs no, no. I don't know. <laughs> Hopelessly uh, devoted. That's it. Live from Rydell High, I'm Larry Colsey for Outlook TV. <laughs> Welcome to Outlook TV, TV for the gay, lesbian, transgendered, and bisexual community. I'm Giovanni, and here's what's happening in our community in the next week. The play, Norman, Is That You?, is playing on March 14th through the 16th at the Terry Fox Theatre in Port Coquitlam. Tickets are $10, and for more information and for reservations, you can call 604-461-3090. The Grease sing-along is happening with host Just In Time. The prizes are awarded for the best costume. It's taking place March 14th and 16th at 8 p.m. at the Pacific Cinema Tech. You can get your tickets at Little Sisters and the Celluloid Drugstore. For more information, log on to www.outonscreen.com. On March 14th, it's Dining Out for Life. You can have breakfast, lunch, or dinner at any of the 170 participating restaurants from Whistler to White Rock to right here at the heart of the West End. 25% of the proceeds will benefit Eleven Spoonful and Friends for Life. And for more information and to find out who is participating, log on to the website at www.diningoutforlife.com. Now, if there's an event that you want our viewers to know about, send it off to us by faxing it at 604-990-6114, or you can email it to us through our website at www.outlooktv.org. I'm Giovanni for Outlook TV. This year, 176 restaurants in the Lower Mainland will be participating in the Dining Out for Life charity event. While many of us are enjoying our meal, chefs are hard at work preparing new menus and seeking out fresh new ingredients. As a chef, I come to work, I check with the prep department, the other people that do all the portioning and the cutting of the fish, uh, find out uh, how the orders were today, how, you know, if there's any problems with them or anything. Find out from our suppliers what is, if they have anything that is special, if anything they'll just have for a couple of days, to, you know, so we can plan specials. Dunning Out for Life started in the USA and is held in 22 American cities. Vancouver is the only Canadian city involved and it is hoped that Toronto will soon join in the fundraising spirit. A lot of people coming to the restaurant tonight for Dining Out for Life do not know that they're coming 
and supporting a good cause like Dining Out for Life. But but that's okay. I mean, there'll be tent cards around and there'll be little pamphlets around, so they'll they will know. They'll know by the time they leave. It's nice if people come and uh, you know donate, even though they, they don't know that. They just you know come there as a matter of course and they get to support a support a good cause. Each week, Karen takes time from her cooking schedule and visits Albion Fisheries okay. to ensure that the fish she purchases is of the highest quality. Did you want to look at some tombo? Sure. Oh. Let's look at tombo. That is also very nice tuna. It's very fresh. Yeah. So it's this is the bloodline, and of course it's it's darker along the bloodline. That's what's close to the the bones on the fish, and it just graduates in pinkness as it goes down to the. Uh, this is the top of the fish. To the top of the fish. And it's it's a it's a lovely color of pink. This this is an excellent tuna. I come to Albion because of the variety of fish here, the freshness, the quality, the service is very good. I've had a tenure relationship with them and uh, most of the times it's been a very good relationship. You can get interesting things from them as well. Sometimes they have things like uh, some great looking tuna, some ahi as well as some tombo, nice looking shark. There was, what else is there, marlin? Nice marlin. Very fresh. Yeah. What is my favorite seafood? I would say Dungeness crab. Just a whole Dungeness crab that's been cooked, chilled, eaten with lemon mayonnaise, just and nothing else. That's it. Crab and mayonnaise. That's one of my favorite things to eat. The crab meat is coming. The crab meat is coming. Next door, processing plant next door. This is fresh Dungeness crab meat. We do it on a daily basis. Ooh, look at this. This leg meat. Num num. Great tasting food for a good cause in Vancouver for Outlook TV. I'm Daniel Lightley. Hi, you're watching Out in the City, and these are the events happening around town this week. The Centre's first annual Night Among Stars is happening. Stardom 2002, the musical celebration, is happening Friday, March 22nd at the Park Hill Hotel on Davie Street. Tickets are $20, and they're available at Little Sisters. Touchstone Theatre presents Hosanna. This is a work of poignant beauty with wicked humour. This will be happening from March 22nd until the beginning of April, so make sure you go and see this show. It's at the Van East Cultural Centre and tickets are available at Ticketmaster. The Dogwood Monarchist Society presents Coronation 2002, the crowning of the new Emperor and Empress. That's this Saturday, March 23rd at Commodore Ballroom on Granville Street. Get tickets at Little Sisters or at Ticketmaster. Girl Gig Productions presents Melissa Farrick in concert with special guest star Yvette. That's happening on Wednesday night, March 27th at the Wise Hall. Doors open at 7, show begins at 8 o'clock. Tickets are for sale in advance only at Little Sisters or at Coco Pelli Hair Salon. Fly Girl Productions presents a Hershey bar with DJ Tracy D on the long weekend Sunday, March 31st. Tickets are available at the door or in advance at Little Sisters or Tech Direct PC. If you have an event that you would like us to list on Out in the City, please contact us at the number or the website listed here and we'll be sure to mention your event. I'm Carol Delinko for Out in the City. Have a great week. Vancouver's gay and lesbian nightlife, vibrant and alive. Some people come here to dance, some people come to socialize. But why do they really come here? What do you think, Darren? Well, Daniel, standing here for the last few minutes and watching the people come in tonight, it's going to be pretty neat to go in and see why people actually do come to the Odyssey. To dance, to party with friends, or maybe to find that special somebody. I think we should go in and have a look, Daniel. Well, the crowds are packing in, so let's join them. The crowd is going wild here at the Odyssey. They're watching us and they think we're mad, but that's okay. Let's talk to our first person and see why he's here. Mike, come on over. Mike, why is it that you're here at the Odyssey tonight? Um, I came for a beer, pretty much. Aside from that, um, I'm not totally sure. I guess uh, I feel comfortable coming out here to dance. And that's about it. But Mike, why are you really here? Why am I really here? Well, I drive up from the burbs, just pretty much, I guess, because... Uh, um, um, why are you really here, Mike? We 
you're looking for usually. Well, we're, we're trying to dig a little bit deeper than that. Let me ask you something. You say you came out here on your own, yeah. right? Do you hope to leave on your own tonight, or what, what, what's up? There's a few not bad looking guys around here. I don't drink, I'm religious, and I go to Trinity Western University. <laughs> oh, well. I'm not Tommy Faye Baker, but I do believe in Jesus. What is the, what is the most amazing or outrageous thing that has ever actually happened to you here at the Odyssey? Ask me again in five minutes. Can I talk to you in the back? And then that will be the most amazing, outrageous thing. I don't know. You know what? That's a lot. That's a lot for me to think about right now. Oh! I come to the Odyssey quite a bit, actually, with my friends and with my girlfriend, because it's a comfortable environment. We like to be here. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a chance for us to let go and get away from our hometown, which is Chilliwack. Ch you live in Chilliwack. So, I do. Uh, now, do you have anything like this in Chilliwack? Uh, no. Apparently, it's said that when you first meet somebody, you have only three seconds to make a first impression. I'm not just a piece of meat. I have a brain, too, so more than that. I saw snow, but I didn't think they'd predict this. Look what just popped up from underneath here. I thought I was here to fluff. Me and four other drag queens shared a taxi home. And uh, I got out of the taxi, and apparently the driver said, oh, she's a fatty but a hottie. Do you think a lot of guys find romance at nightclubs? Have you been here before? Friday night, OK? You're here at the Odyssey. Yeah. What's going through your mind? Well, I kind of got a fight with my boyfriend today. So, you know, I'm here to pick up. No, I'm not really. I'm just kidding. I just wanted to get drunk. So, and I did. Sweet. There you have it. Views and opinions of a Friday night, snow evening at the Odyssey. I'm Darren Storsley for Outlook TV. Last week on Outlook TV, we brought you an edition of Men's Night Out at the Odyssey. But where do the ladies go? Tonight, we're going to find out. Do you go to women's only bars? I've been to a lesbian bar once. There's a women's only bar. When I was there in the female dominated nights, um, it was a very easy going atmosphere. It makes no difference to me. I don't head out to the bar to pick someone up. I go to dance. If the tunes are right, I don't care what kind of a bar it is. We had the uh, ladies' night, they're happening every Saturday night, and um, we started our own night as well on the Saturday night, which we called Honey Bee. We are definitely moving in Milk, which is another venue in the hotel, and I think has uh, a, a nicer room. I think it will suit up more, and we'll make it uh, definitely a women-only event. Look what just dragged in here. Where are you off to tonight? It's my night out. Do you want to come with me? I would love to come with you. Let's go. Let's go. Honey is, has a lot of oriental flair, a lot of detail. If you're into that, definitely come and visit. Big red velvet couches, throw pillows. There is the bar, which is the center of the room, and it's sunken bar. So it's, it's very unique. You go. You go have dinner, honey, you go to milk thinking you're in a different establishment, but yet it's still in the same building, and you want to go for a late night dancing, you go downstairs, and there's the underground club where the music is pumping, everyone's dancing. Whether you come in a suit or jeans, gay, lesbian, straight, student, professional, you know, they just come together, they're there for the music, they're there to have a good time. I think it's so important that women know that they have a place to go to for socialization. It's like it's almost like a club feeling. You get to meet friends there. You get to know your friends are going to show up there on a Saturday night. And to go there and have some fun is just so important. I guess an eclectic mix of people, for sure. Like, all walks of life are in here, um, as well as uh, great music, like great DJs. I can't say anything bad about any of the DJs I've heard in either here or Milk or downstairs of the Lotus. If the women came out and supported it and believed in it, then hopefully there'll be more venues like Milk. There'll be a steady venue for them, not this once a month, and then it moves to a different venue. You know, if, if they own this night in Milk and support it, then they'll have it.
for as long as they want it. Well, it's not the Miss America pageant. It's the night at the Lotus. I'm Darren Storsley for Outlook TV. We live in quite a different world than the pre-AIDS Montreal where Michelle Tremblay's gay classic Hosanna first premiered. But this timeless tale of love and betrayal has definitely not lost its edge. And then, the marble doors, the real marble doors, opened wide and the crowd exploded! And Elizabeth Taylor made her entrance, borne aloft in her chair. Her chair is suspended on a double axle to keep her level. Well, I chose this play because uh, I run a company uh, that does Canadian theatre. That's our mandate. And we do a lot of new Canadian work. I was really specifically interested in um, seeing what would happen if we revived an older Canadian play. I remembered this play because it was a big part of my... Um, becoming interested in theatre. I saw it when I was 16. It really opened people's eyes uh, to a whole culture, um, to a whole way of speaking, um, and uh, it was it was not only controversial but very successful. Well, maybe I'm fat, Hosanna, but at least I still grab them. He still grabs them. He still grabs them, all right. In the parks, yeah. In the meat racks, yeah. In the back alleys, at the movies, at the toilets. Oh, it's true. You used to be good looking once, Grant. But now, now you're nothing but a washroom cowboy. I don't have to go there. I do it for kicks. <laughs> then where did you meet your Renanda? <laughs> the shock value of the play is not as strong as it certainly was at the time when it was first presented, which was a lot about, like, oh my God, we're hearing a drag queen talk on stage. Um, there's been a lot of gay characters in theatre since then, um, drag characters even. Um, there's been a lot of exploration of sexual identity and just identity per se in the theatre since that time. So a lot of those things that were just new and cutting edge are, are not so new uh, uh, anymore. I think it's one of those plays that takes you on an incredible emotional journey. Like, you know, and it sounds like a cliche, you laughed, you cried, but I mean, that really does happen in Hosanna. It's a real purging. Yeah. And I think you also That's walk right. away with it from this, with when this incredible comes, sense yeah. of knowing these two characters yeah. intimately. Like, they're extreme, but they're real. And there's a stripping away process that happens throughout the play, where we kind of go from the, the outside of the characters, which are very much almost um, archetypal, right? And then we strip away to, to kind of the core of who they really are. Touchstone Theatre's production of Hosanna plays at the Vancouver East Cultural Centre until April 6th. For performance times and ticket details, check our website. It's outlooktv.org. I'm Larry Colsey for Outlook TV. We're delving into the secret world of the drag queen. We're going to join Beverly X and Nina Tron as they metamorphosize from Brian and Aaron. Well, I'm applying my pan stick and uh, applying it like so that it fits into my pores and that. And after I get it all smoothed and even, then I will apply a powder to set it. And then you have like a canvas and you paint on that. That's your face. And will that last all night? It should because after you're finished, you you spray it with hairspray, and that way, if you perspire, it, it, it wipes off easy and doesn't. Uh, um, ruin your makeup. There's this famous drag queen, Jimmy James, and he did a character <laughs> called Beverly the Slut. And it, it, she was just something. I fell in love with her right away. So that's where the name Beverly came from. This is the powder. See, you just put this on gently and then you brush it all off. Like, I have small eyes, so the way I paint my eyes, I paint them to make them look bigger. You sort of look like a clown until then you put on the eyelashes <laughs> and blend it all together. And... Ladies, what's the biggest misconception about drag queens? I think the biggest misconception is that we want to do this every day. And for me, it's just something fun to do on a temporary basis. 
And what's your biggest mis? What do you think the biggest misconception is? Um, well, that we should pay for our own drinks. This is Vancouver's night for drag queens from all over North America to sparkle and shine. For some drag queens or illusion artists, this is a way of life. For others, it's just plain fun. For Outlook TV, I'm Richard Ferguson. The gay games are just around the corner and joining me today is Kim McDonald who is the co-chair of Team Vancouver. The history of the gay games very simply is it started in San Francisco in 1982. They then held it again in 1986. 1990 came to Vancouver with Celebration 90. Moved on to New York in 1998 and, and Amsterdam in 2000, oh, sorry, in, did I say that wrong? In 1996 in New York, 1998 in Amsterdam and this year, 2002, it will be in Sydney. Uh, Australia and using a lot of the Olympic facilities that we saw on TV in the year 2000. The Sydney committee is really ready to fa bring the world in and they've exceeded their registration, early registration uh, goals by over 2,000 people. Already swimming has been completely filled and so has yachting and other, other sports are filling up as well as the cultural events. If anybody saw the opening and closing ceremonies of, of the Olympics, obviously the Australians know how to put on put on a party, they know how to put on a pre uh, an opening and closing ceremonies. They've found a couple of facilities that they want to use that will be very um, user friendly, they'll be able to fill them, it'll be very uh, emotional, it'll be very full, it'll be very wonderful experience including lots of entertainment. They haven't named who, who they have exactly but uh, we just know from what the plans they've made that they're, they're going to have something that's just going to wow us and Amsterdam certainly wowed us and we, we think that Sydney is even going to be able to take it one step past that. After having gone to Sydney last year for the annual meeting of the Federation Gay Games, I can tell you they know how to put on things down in Sydney. In order to go to, to Australia with Team Vancouver, uh, they can get in touch with us using our website, www.teamvancouver.net, uh, and they can phone the Extra West line. The most important thing, though, is to get registered with Sydney 2002 and uh, choose their sport and get their registration process started. Then they can get in touch with Team Vancouver. Uh, we will be in several events during the summer as well to answer questions for people and we'll be promoting uh, those events through Extra West uh, every two weeks. The events and the dates for Gay Games 6 in Sydney are from October 26th to November 9th with the opening ceremonies on November 2nd with the sport part of the program only going from November 2nd to the 9th and the cultural event going all the way from the 26th to the 9th. They'll be using the facilities all in downtown Sydney, all of the Olympic site facilities that they can get and several of the different high schools and, and uh, community, group, community spaces that are in Sydney. Sydney's quite ready to receive the Gay Games. Come to the Gay Games in 2002. I'll buy you a drink. So buy those new Speedos, put on those old running shoes, dust off that bike, and I'll see you in Sydney in 2002's Gay Games. I'm Fred Camperman with Outlook TV. I was recently in a coffee shop and the music playing in this coffee shop really caught my attention. So when I asked who the artist was, I was told that it was a local musician by the name of Thomas Donovan. Well of course when I heard this I had to find out more. So we're about to catch up with Thomas at the Utopia Parkway studio in Kitsilano. I've been writing music all my life. I just started recording music over the last 10 years. 
Got three CDs out. Digital Dreams was the first one. The second one was called Trance in 96. And then the last one was One Moment to Fly. But I've done a series of singles as well. You had had some success in the States and uh, you've done a tour in Germany. I'm curious why you're really not that well known around here. Well, there aren't really a lot of avenues for exposure for independent talent in Vancouver. There used to be, but they've kind of sold out. So as an independent, it's really up to you to connect with your audience, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. You kind of stuff your music into the cracks in the system, so to speak. And those cracks are really the internet or independently owned radio stations that still play music based on the merit of the material rather than record company pressure. So like university, college, radio. But the, in the, the internet is, real, is really the big part of it. There aren't really any stations on, on the, the FM band or whatever that, that promote the independent music scene. There's, there's community TV out there, but there's nothing really in the radio spectrum. Sex CITR, I guess, is about the only one left. What about co-op radio? Um, I've, I've had songs on co-op radio too and interviews, but um, it doesn't have a wide listenership. So uh, what are your future plans? Just keep doing what I'm doing. I write music for me. You know, it's my therapy. It's my healing process. Thomas goes through a you know a life crisis or you know crash and burn relationship, and then writes a song to get over it. So I'll just keep doing what what I deserve to do. You know, that's my thing. If someone would like to uh, get a hold of uh, one of your CDs, how would they go about doing that? You can order your own copy online at thomasdonovan.com, or just download the songs for free if you want. It's not really about money to me or fame. It's about sharing things back to the community and um, just doing what I love to do. There was a full house at the Odyssey on Sunday night to honor groups and individuals who have made a special contribution to the gay and lesbian community. Well, we've held this for five years now and we do it because we think it's really important to have one night a week where we all get together as gays and lesbians, bisexual and transgender people, and say thanks to those who've really worked, done special things all through the year, whether it's in sports or arts or activism, whatever it is, to say thanks and uh, keep it up. You know, we are, it, the work you're doing out there is really appreciated because it's a lot of things happening out there uh, on many, many fronts, and it's just lovely to take a pause and say thanks. Was there a personal highlight for you tonight? Yeah, it was seeing the uh, Glass Youth Choir up on the, on that stage, you know. To, to think that there's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds out there that are coming into the next generation and, you know, they they're, they sing for activism and they're active in their high schools to make it a better world to be queer for the next generation. That was the highlight for me. What an absolutely heart-rending group of people. Yeah, yeah. Why did you win the Activist Award? What is Activist about your choir? I think it's because we were the first gay and lesbian youth choir in North America, and maybe the world even, and that um, is a big thing because it goes beyond youth groups, and we're representing, um, you know, youth being able to do things that adults can do, gay and lesbian youth, in a safe environment, as opposed to having to worry about whether or not we're going to be bashed by other people. Little Sisters is a true center of our community, and two familiar faces there receive special honors. Jim Diva as Hero of the Year, and Janine Fuller for a Lifetime of Achievement. Would you please give a big warm welcome to this year's winner, Ms. Janine Fuller. Well, you know, it's a real honor anytime you get an award from the community and I'm really accepting it on behalf of all the people who have worked so hard invisibly around the court case, the people who work at the store. When I Thank first moved to Vancouver, I thought, oh, I'll work at a bookstore and have a nice quiet life, but not quite the case. Janine Fuller deserves any award anyone ever gives her and ten more after. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the award, this year the Community Hero Award goes to Mr. Jim Diva. <laughs> I truly, honestly believe from the very roots and foundations of who I am that the gay and lesbian community has the power to change the world.
we are just now getting over, I think, our, our political struggles. I mean, there's more to achieve, but we're gaining so much. And now I think we, we actually can offer ourselves and show, this is how you run a community. This is how you run a society. You do it with inclusiveness. You do it with a care for people. And I think we are the people that can show the world how to do that. And we've got to get together. We've got to get more organized. And we've got to go ahead with it. For details on all Heroes Award winners, check our website. At the Extra West Community Achievement Awards, I'm Larry Colsey for Outlook TV.